just wanted to give a brief thank you, Frank, you know, not only for, for resources, but he was our friend. I mean, he really, really was our friend. But I'd like to think that maybe he's looking down and joining in by video conferencing of some kind. <laughs> Without further ado, I'll pass off to Dan, and um, who's going to chair the next session. So, um, one of the really amazing things about Chuck is his eye for talent. And uh, it seems kind of idiosyncratic at times, but he has this amazing eye for talent. And so, uh, I mean, he missed it on me, but... Uh, 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 <laughs> I think you were on sabbatical at the time or something, so I, I, yeah, I got lucky. I see. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but in 1981, uh, Chuck was able to uh, bring to Hopkins uh, Ron Brookmeyer, Steve Self, and Hendrix Brown, right? And then the following year brought uh, Scott and Kung Yee, uh to Hopkins, which really just uh, changed the face of the department and they have done incredible things. And so uh, we're going to hear from four of them now. And then, of course, we had Mei Chang also recruited under, uh, under Chuck, and we had Karen, right, recruited under Chuck. And so what an amazing lineup. Uh, and so, uh, Chuck, thanks for doing that because I've had the benefits of being mentored by all of them, and um, so it's, it's great. So um, Ron uh, is going to be our first speaker, and uh, Ron um, came to us um, – uh, was in the University of Wisconsin, right, and uh, joined the faculty here, uh, and then uh, we unfortunately lost him in 2010, uh, where he uh, joined as professor of biostatistics at uh, UCLA, UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. And while he was at Hopkins, uh, he was the director of our MPH program for uh, from 2002 to 2008. Um, he is on the statistics uh, uh, editing uh, board of reviewing editors for science. Um, he's had an amazing number of uh, distinguished lectures at many universities. Uh, he's been the presidential invited to address at uh, Weenar and Enar. Uh, he's an amazing teacher. He's won awards, Golden Apple Award here at Hopkins, and and I saw on your CV that you've won awards already at uh, at UCLA for your teaching there. Um, he's uh, been awarded by the CDC uh, for his work, and he was a Spiegel Woman Award winner in 1992. And you'll hear about more Spiegelman Awards winners uh, in a, a few minutes. Um, he's a member of the IOM of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a fellow of the American Association of Advancing of Science. And what really is amazing about Ron is when there is a public health epidemic, like AIDS or dealing with anthrax, he's on the front line um, you know, dealing with those issues. And so he's made amazing contributions in those areas, and we're going to hear more about some of his work uh, now. So thank you, Ron. Dan, thank you for that very kind and generous um, introduction. Uh, Mei Chen and Karen, uh, thank you for organizing this and everyone else who was involved in organizing a really uh, spectacular event, uh, which I wouldn't miss for the world. Um, so I came in 1981, and uh, it is really hard to believe that it has been 34 years. Um, it seems like yesterday uh, that uh, Chuck and uh, Sevilla uh, picked me up at the airport on my first visit to Baltimore. And it, we had a wonderful dinner. And that was followed by many dinners at their home. And uh, they created a family for me at Hopkins and for Robin. Um, Chuck built a culture of family in Hopkins Biostatistics that lives today. He created opportunities for me. Uh, he uh, he uh, made an opportunity for me to go to France to uh, visit the International Agency for Research on Cancer very early on, on uh, in my career, and that actually had a profound uh, effect on me. So. The, I think one message that Chuck always um, told me and communicated to me was work on what you think is important. It's about doing good science. And uh, that, uh, that and the words of trust and encouragement 
um, I really couldn't ask for anything more. Uh, and, um, and Chuck, thank you for helping build my career. Um, and Sevilla and Chuck, uh, thank you for making Baltimore and Hopkins um, a place that we still call home. So Now, um, Chuck has a great appreciation for history. And, uh, and in this fabulous article written by Chuck and colleagues, and in fact that Karen highlighted uh, a number of uh, elements of this morning uh, about the uh, history of the Johns Hopkins Department of Biostatistics in, this, in a book, uh, Strength in Numbers, uh, the Rise of Academic Department Statistics. And it's great and chronicles uh, the very rich history of the department. Now, um, speaking of uh, history, um, it's not only the 50th anniversary that we are uh, celebrating for Chuck, but it's also the uh, 100th anniversary of what was called the Welsh Rose Report, uh, the Institute of Hygiene Report, uh, which really laid out the blueprint for schools of public health. And uh, in that report it says, the advancement of knowledge, the cultivation of hygiene as a science is one of the great needs and should be a fundamental aim of an institute of hygiene. And uh, that was a principle by which Chuck led. Uh, that science and evidence is really a compass for good public health practice. So in this, uh, what I'd like to do in this talk is discuss some overlap between two subjects. Um, one is biostatistics, and uh, the second is one that's getting increasing attention, which is agent-based models. So what is an agent-based model? Uh, an agent-based model is essentially a micro-simulation of interacting agents or individuals. Uh, they're used to model complex systems in public health. It's been used for uh, studies of the spatial patterns of disease, for obesity, uh, and most, uh, and its earliest history uh, traces back to uh, infectious disease modeling. And in fact, agent-based models uh, and its earliest history can be traced back to Johns Hopkins University. And here we have uh, Lowell Reed, who developed the Reed-Frost model for infectious diseases. Of course, Lowell Reed was a professor of biostatistics a uh, dean of the school, president of the university. And uh, in some footage I'm going to show you in a minute, um, in 1951, there on Tuesday nights, there was a television show called the Johns Hopkins Science Review. And it would appear weekly. And here we have Lowell Reed uh, describing the Reed Frost model for the spread of infectious diseases, and he's going to do it by a, uh, a physical model. And uh, so here we go. A very simple machine that will allow us to consider the theory and apply it within the laboratory. We have here a wooden trough, which may be thought of as the city within which the people will live and move and circulate. That then is the city for a group of people that will be represented by simple beads. These white beads are susceptible individuals. They are the people who have not had the disease and may acquire the disease. The other class of people of interest is naturally the cases. These spotted beads represent the cases. They are the people who are ill. It is those individuals that will transfer the 
disease to these susceptible individuals. When the individual has had his case and is recovered, he then becomes an immune person, which will be represented by the purple people. So that we'll have the three categories of people that are essential to a simple epidemic, the susceptible, the cases, and the immune. When are we ready to try a simple epidemic with this machine? We may start an epidemic by assuming that we have a hundred susceptible people. We'll put those hundred people together. We will introduce into that population one case. We'll have here a case of measles that we'll put in with that population. We must have some procedure for allowing chance contact to play, allowing that case to come into contact with the others. We shall accomplish that by making use of these black beads, which are barriers, and you will see the effects of those as the epidemic is run. Now to operate an epidemic, we have here 100 susceptible people. We have a case. They now start their process of living and moving within the city and mixing together according to chance. And in that chance mixing, that case will meet a certain number of susceptible and will produce new cases. And we shall see the result of the epidemic. Here we have the epidemic with one case here, and it is in contact with four susceptibles. In contact with four susceptibles because it falls between the black bars. So that this one case in circulating through the city has encountered four susceptible people. The next step of the epidemic, of course, means that this case here now recovers from his disease and he becomes an immune. And so we introduce an immune. This susceptible person that was in contact with him now becomes a case. And so with the other susceptible people. So we replace the three susceptible people with three cases. We have a total of four susceptibles at four cases now. Our population then stands. Our original case is an immune, and we have four new cases. Therefore, we have a remainder of 95 susceptibles. That would represent the first stage of the epidemic and the first transfer from the case to the susceptible. The next stage of transfer would be the events that would follow from having four cases now circulating in the population. And we can see the four cases circulate in the population, producing disease according to the individuals with whom they come in contact. The Reed Frost model of the spread of infectious diseases. Um, it didn't stop there. Uh, here is our beloved Helen Abbey, who followed on that work and uh, extended it and looked at the various assumptions underlying uh, the Reed Frost model. The, uh, the uh, tradition of Hopkins uh, in modeling of this sort continues with many colleagues at the school uh, here currently developing models along these lines. Um, Interest in agent-based models is increasing, uh, but they're also getting increasingly complex, highly computational. What's the intersection with more traditional biostatistics? Well, um, I'd like to reflect a little bit on some, some areas of overlap. And my own work on this, uh, started with uh, a project on combination HIV prevention. Uh, it was a, a project uh, that's uh, based in, uh, in South Africa uh, with colleagues actually here at Hopkins, including Chris Beyer uh, and Steph Burrell, and, uh, and uh, 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 as well as colleagues at UCLA, Emory, and at the University of Cape Town. And the idea of the project was to look at what's the impact 
of, uh, of different combinations of prevention programs. So what are the potential effects of four possible uh, uh, components of an HIV prevention program to prevent transmission? And here are the four components uh, of a comprehensive program that we were studying. One is, first, counseling to reduce high-risk behaviors. The second component was antiretroviral therapy for infected people. And what that would do is decrease their viral load and therefore uh, make them less infectious to others. The third component is called pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. And what that is, is antiretroviral treatments for uninfected people, because that can make them less susceptible to becoming infected themselves. And the fourth is screening for HIV, testing whether somebody's infected or not. In fact, the first three components wouldn't work very well if we weren't identifying who is infected and who is not. And so there would be interactions between these four components. Um, the goal was to understand, uh, ultimately, to test, evaluate in trials how this combination prevention would work. So how do we design such a study? And we looked at using agent-based models to help design prevention trials. Can it give us some idea of what the effect size would be which is a key ingredient in sample size determination, and what kind of variation you might see. So we developed an agent-based model for combination HIV prevention. Um, we uh, uh, had attributes assigned to each individual or agent at the start. We did daily updates uh, in this micro simulation. We put in these prevention interventions. And we also worried and modeled about social and sexual networks. Social and sexual networks. How do people connect? Um, not like the, that random mixing that we saw in the Reed Frost model. Uh, but instead, we looked at uh, uh, networks that included regular partners, main partners, um, casual partners, and, and their uh, interactions and contact rates over time. And uh, that generates a complex web of, of social and sexual networks with regard to how infections spread in populations. And here the, the red dots are infected people and the blue dots are uninfected people. And we ran this micro simulation for many combinations of HIV prevention programs. Actually, we did it for 162 different combinations of prevention programs, um, each one corresponding to different levels. So for example, the level of coverage of antiretroviral treatment. What percent of eligible people get treatment? the level of coverage of PrEP, what percent of eligible people are getting uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, by how much can we reduce high-risk behaviors? And by how much can we increase HIV testing? So what percent of people uh, would have received an HIV test? And for each of these combinations of programs, uh, we did many replicates. Uh, and. Uh, and, uh, and then for each of these, we looked at the proportion infected over five years and also what the variance, the, this, the, the variability that we see in those proportions. So here are the results of all of that. And uh, each dot here represents an HIV prevention program. So on the horizontal axis is the proportion infected, and on the vertical axis is the uh, variance of that proportion. And uh, for example, the red dot there represents the baseline in the community in South Africa that we are working. That is, if we don't do anything, what, do we, what does the model predict 
for the proportion who would be infected in five years. Here's another dot. That's the blue dot there. And that dot I, we chose uh, because that was uh, uh, a program that, that our colleagues thought was attainable in this community in South Africa. And what that blue dot it represents is a 34% reduction in the uh, proportion infected. 34% of infections could potentially be averted with the blue dot compared to the red dot. That blue dot, the program that that blue dot corresponds to, is a 15%, if you could achieve a 15% reduction in high-risk behaviors, um, a decrease in 50% of those people who've never had an HIV test, 50% uh, coverage of people with antiretroviral therapy, and a 50% coverage with, uh, with PrEP. Now, um, the black line, uh, we took our simulation, uh, agent-based model simulation results, and modeled the variance. And that represents the solid black line. And what's shown in the dotted line is the binomial variance. And it illustrates that the binomial variance significantly underestimates uh, the variance that we found through the simulation by greater than 50%. So why is that? It's because of the stochasticity of epidemics Epi and, and the networks and the network structure. So epidemics spread more rapidly when an infection is introduced into large interconnected networks. But it's going to spread more slowly if introduced into more isolated networks. And that creates an additional source of variability which is not accounted for by simple models and can lead to underpowered studies. For example, in community randomized trials, which we heard Larry Moulton uh, discuss this morning, we can decompose the variance into three components, the variance of the proportion infected that we'd see. First is there's the usual random sampling source. That is, okay, you're not going to sample everybody in the community. But then there's this additional source, which is the stochasticity of epidemics that results from the network structure. And a third component is the variation that we see in characteristics between communities. This is a decomposition of that variance into the first two components that I had on the last slide. And what you're seeing here is um, uh, three segments for small samples, uh, medium sample sizes, and large sample sizes that you're drawing of the community. And, uh, and it's being decomposed. Uh, the total variance is the solid black line. And then the uh, small dotted line is the source of variation from random sampling. And the dotted line that's bigger dashes is the stochastic epidemic component coming from this network, network structure. And what you see is when the sample size is small, it's the random sampling that's dominating. That's the main source of variation. But when you get to more moderate sample sizes, you see that the main component is coming from this stochastic epidemic component, which if you ignore, um, can lead to again, underpowered studies. And in fact, the history of HIV prevention trials, we've had a few notable successes recently, but generally the history previously of HIV prevention trials have been scattered with failures. And as Steve Lagakos wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine and in the Insti in Institute of Medicine report, a key methodological problem in HIV prevention trials has been inadequate sample sizes resulting in inconclusive trial results. So coming back to the intersection between, uh, and the common ground between agent-based modeling and traditional biostatistics, and both have a lot to learn from each other. So biostatistics helps reflect on a lot of the uncertainties in agent-based models and the sensitivities and all of the inputs that go into them. 
But agent-based models can also inform traditional biostatistics. And, and I've highlighted in one area, study design, where it can help you get an, a sense of the effect size, particularly at a community level when you're using multiple components to a program. It can give you a, an assessment of the variability that you might see, which might be missed by traditional or simple naive uh, models. And it can look at more complex phenomena, such as migration or immigration across communities in community randomized trials, or contamination between different treatment groups, which couldn't really be solved analytically. And it can look at different sampling strategies and approaches, not just random sampling, but other things that have been entertained, uh, such as uh, respondent-driven sampling or venue-based sampling, which have issues. Uh, but agent-based models offer a route to understand what those issues are, their biases, and the sources of variability. Now, Chuck actually has spent a lot of time thinking very hard about sampling and the importance of thinking about your sampling both in your uh, design and analysis. So um, circling back to Chuck, uh, I just want to uh, say that his leadership style has been always about finding the common ground. So um, in closing, um, I'd like to uh, raise our glasses <laughs> and uh, propose a toast to Chuck. Uh, Chuck, like a, a fine bottle of wine, you keep getting better. And to thank you for creating a supportive academic family where the best science flourishes.